Welcome to South East Today. I'm Rob Smith. And I'm Natalie Graham. Tonight's top stories. A catalogue of shocking abuse and death threats. We exclusively reveal the level of intimidation suffered by our MPs. This is people who are saying they wish you died of cancer, they wish you uh, someone murdered you. We hear how it's affecting their families and how it's led some to consider giving up politics altogether. Also in tonight's programme, parents angered after dozens of Sussex pupils are sent home on the first day of term for apparently not wearing the right uniform. We'll be live in Seaford with the latest. Judy Dench and Eddie Izzard are regal mother and son in a new film about Queen Victoria. No luck, Dad. Never mind. We're still a few. And the end of an era, how the last physical editions of the Yellow Pages will be delivered in Brighton. Good evening. Nearly half of MPs who responded to a BBC South East Today questionnaire say they have received death threats. The scale and scope of the abuse has left some politicians considering whether to give up their careers altogether. Tonight, this programme can exclusively reveal a shocking catalogue of intimidation. Our MPs say they've suffered threats being made about their children, in some cases having to use undercover police officers for protection at public events. And one MP says that they've received thousands of highly abusive messages. In a moment, our special correspondent Colin Campbell will be looking at the impact being caused by so-called internet trolls. But first, our political editor Helen Catt reports on the rising tide of abuse being faced by politicians in the South East. In politics, feelings always run high. But many MPs say abuse and intimidation has risen to new levels. Now, research by BBC South East Today has shown some of the shocking aggression our politicians have been exposed to. This is people who are saying they wish you died of cancer, they wish you, uh, someone murdered you, they wish that, you know, some people on Facebook were having a debate about, you know, switching off their dash cam so that if someone ran me over there'd be no evidence. You know, that's quite, that's a different level. Around half of those who responded to our questionnaire said they'd been sent at least one death threat. Many reported receiving abusive messages on a weekly basis. Almost all had increased their security in some way. Some MPs told us their families had also been threatened. Somebody uh, decided to publish where my children went to school and were encouraging people uh, to, uh, to, to uh, pursue them. So uh, obviously uh, my own safety is, is one thing, but when somebody starts threatening the safety of your children, um, then that really uh, is very disturbing. It was the murder of Labour MP Joe Cox in 2016 that sparked serious concerns over the safety of politicians, heightened further by a terror attack on the Houses of Parliament earlier this year. But for many South East politicians, it's verbal attacks they're most likely to face, particularly on social media sites like Facebook. People can make threats and you have to judge how realistic that they are if you're being threatened with sexual violence or just violence against your person is trying to understand the mentality of that person but it's very hard to do on social media you don't know whether they've got mental health issues or whether they're just bullies so it makes it much more tricky to manage our research suggests that politicians of all parties are being targeted they say it's not about shutting down political criticism though we all welcome vigorous debate because that's why we got into politics it's just i think it's quite useful if people are aware that if they see or hear someone just being really horribly abusive, just to step in and tell that person, get a life, have a thought and have a think about the impact of what you do. While racism and sexism are certainly factors in some cases, it seems that for MPs returning to Westminster today, facing abuse is simply becoming part of the job. Helen Catt, BBC South East Today. Well, at least three MPs here have told us that they have considered quitting politics altogether because of the level of abuse they've received. And there are concerns from other politicians that so-called internet trolls are eroding democracy by deterring people from getting involved in politics at all. Our report from special correspondent Colin Campbell does contain some strong and offensive language. You get called all the sorts of names that you'd expect, um, prostitute, slut, whore. Threatening, threatening violence and threatening to do things to me. Their politicians targeted through social media, bombarded with abusive messages. Police and Crime Commissioner Katie Bourne says she's even received a death threat. 
She wants social media companies to do more. I think it's easy to hide behind a big corporation and say, well, the onus is on you to, to deal with it. I don't think that's acceptable anymore. Christy Adams, Conservative Party, 18,185. Christy Adams stood as a Conservative candidate in Hove at the last general election. She says online abuse was directed at her and her children. She became so concerned for their safety, she didn't want them to walk to school. Has this made you think twice about becoming an MP? Um, yeah, definitely. I'm in discussion with my family about that, but I don't want to let the bullies beat me. <laughs> and I think, why shouldn't I, as a normal, decent human being, be allowed to stand in public life? Police are taking action. Sticking his fingers up at the press as he walked into court, Eastbourne resident Mark Sands was jailed for four months in April. On his Facebook page, he wrote, If you vote to take my money, I'll come round your house and personally stab you to death. A message aimed at then MP Caroline Ansell. Mark Sands did agree to be interviewed but pulled out this morning, only saying that he didn't wish to stir it all up again. He did tell me that he regretted posting the messages and never intended to cause Caroline Ansell or her family any distress or upset. He says he hasn't worked since 2001 and has mental health issues that require prescription medication. Caroline Ansell fears abuse via social media is eroding democracy. Online, it is closing down discussion, it's closing down debate. People are really reluctant to voice their opinions and actually it drives people apart then. And what an unhealthy thing it is for our democracy that people who do see the world differently can't come together and find a way forward. You tend to try and brush it off in front of other people, but when you go home and you think about it, it's difficult. For those on the receiving end, abuse is at best tiresome. At worst, though, it's proving destructive and silencing. Colin Campbell, BBC South East Today, Hove. Let's talk to our political editor, Helen Catt, who joins us in the studio. And Helen, many public figures experience abuse do MPs have a particular problem? Well, interestingly, several MPs I spoke to said they didn't want to talk publicly about their experiences because actually they felt that constituents quite often face sort of attacks on a day-to-day -day basis in some jobs and that they didn't want to appear indulgent. But I think there is something about the role of an MP which does tend to attract sort of threatening messages. Firstly, they are making the decisions that affect people's lives. That is always going to bring with it a level of anger, a level of emotion. So I think partly that is behind it. The second thing is that MPs have to be accessible to anyone who knocks on their door. That is the great thing about the way our parliamentary democracy system works, and I'm sure they would say that. But that does, of course, in some ways make them vulnerable, as we saw with what happened to Joe Cox. So it's trying to balance that. The big fear, as we heard a little bit of in, in Colin's report there, is that you know this sense of, of more and more aggression and abuse could actually dissuade some people from going into politics at all. Helen, thank you very much. And you can see more coverage of this issue, including details of local councillors who've received death threats, on our website, bbc.co.uk slash Sussex and slash Kent. You can also go to our Facebook page and on Twitter. Now, coming up in a moment, the Coast Guard monitoring a huge crack in the cliffs in Sussex warn it's widening and could collapse at any moment. Parents have accused a Sussex head teacher of overreacting after dozens of children were sent home from a secondary school today for not wearing the correct uniform. Yes, dozens of pupils were apparently sent home from Seaford Head School this morning. Parents were given an email yesterday warning that the uniform policy would be strictly enforced for the start of the new term. John Hunt reports. 15-year-old Shannon Moore was one pupil caught up in the school's uniform crackdown today. Apparently my skirt was too short, even though it's on my knees. Right. It's like the first day of year 11, walking to school and being taken straight away. I think it's silly, really. They just missed a whole day of it learning for a skirt. The school uniform policy states that skirts should sit no lower than the top of the knee. Shannon's mum says her daughter's skirt complies. I'm unsure as to why there are any major issues with this skirt. It's not obscene, it's not creating a drama or a problem. It's just absolutely ridiculous. She's missed a day's worth of education, her first day back in year 11, her GCSE year. I've been called out of my job three times today um, about this incident, which, to be quite honest, isn't even justified. 
The school wrote to parents yesterday saying that they hope to focus on learning at the beginning of the school year. They said that students must adhere to the school uniform policy, including skirt length, footwear and bags. It warned parents that pupils will be sent home immediately if their uniform does not meet the school's high standards. One person said their son was sent home for the wrong shoes. One person said their son didn't have the right bag, so they sent him home to change his bag. I just think it's a bit ridiculous, to be honest. If they spent as much time teaching the children and worrying about their education as they do what they're looking like, the kids would be a lot better off. Last year, the police had to be called to Hartsdown Academy in Margate after 50 pupils were sent home for flouting the school's uniform rules. Seaford Head is a good school, one parent told me. She wouldn't appear on camera, but said pupils need to have the right uniform and wear it properly. Shannon's mother says she's now been told that Shannon's skirt is OK after all and should be wearing it again tomorrow. Well, John Hunt joins us from outside Seaford Head School. Um, John, so what have the school had to say about this today? Well, I was able to have a brief conversation with the head, Bob Ellis, after school this afternoon. He was just about to go into a management meeting. Uh, he said he was disappointed we're running this story today. I asked him how many pupils had been sent home. Uh, he didn't have an exact figure to hand right there and then, but he said not many at all. Nowhere near the 50 that some have been rumouring on social media. Uh, he said that in the first instance of a, a uniform problem, the parent will be telephoned before any child is uh, sent home home. Now we have had an update from uh, Shannon Moore's mum this evening. We just caught her coming out of the school a few moments ago. Uh, she says that Shannon Moore will receive an apology from the school when she turns up at the gates tomorrow. OK, John, thank you. There are calls for the swift deportation of a man from Afghanistan who's been convicted of a hammer attack on two Sussex police officers. Yamshid Purs, who's already been convicted of murder in the Netherlands, hit out at police with a claw hammer while resisting arrest. The Conservative MP for Crawley, Henry Smith, said that there was widespread anger at the recent news his minimum sentence had been reduced to three years. Workers at three Sussex hospitals have voted overwhelmingly for strike action, according to the GMB union. The staff at community hospitals in Lewis, Crowborough and Uckfield are all employed by NHS property services. They say they're unhappy about planned changes to their jobs and haven't been consulted. The union says 96% of those who voted supported strike action. Now, people are once again being warned to stay away from the cliff edge in Seaford, but this time because of heightened concerns over a large, potentially dangerous crack that's opened up in the chalk face. The Coast Guard believes that the split's become much larger during recent changes in the weather. But a number of recent cliff falls along that stretch of coast haven't stopped people sitting on the edge, apparently unaware it could collapse at any time. Lauren Moss reports. A huge crack splitting the cliff face at Seaford. A new cordon and a fresh warning not to go too close to the edge or the bottom. We spent the day with the Eastbourne lifeguard team just a few miles away and it's a warning they're also echoing along the coastline. A lot of people come into the area uh, that are from different countries, coming from uh, away from the coast, and it's a beautiful uh, area to come and visit, and they just are not aware of the, the, the dangers. The RNLI, uh, through their community life-saving scheme, are trying to make people aware of these dangers that are coming to the, uh, to the area, um, but I think it's just lack of knowledge of the inherent dangers that are here. In June, there were three chalk falls in the space of 48 hours at Seaford, and the Coast Guard says it's impossible to predict where or when the next one will be. Further along at Eastbourne, the cliff isn't only cracking but eroding underneath, meaning the top is increasingly unstable. We're 20 to 30 metres away from the cliff face here at Beachy Head and all the way along you can see cracks that are appearing in the chalk. There's even a cliff fall there but just above that there are people walking along the cliff edge, they're having picnics and they're taking photographs completely oblivious to the many cracks that are just below them. We constantly put the message out there. There's been a lot of news about Beachy Head at the moment and the changes, constant cracks reappearing. So we just need to, you know, remind people about please be aware of the dangers. You know, don't go near the edge of the cliff. There are large cracks, um, so large chunks of cliff are falling away at any time. But some people seem determined to continue to take risks. Risks that could be fatal. 
Well, Lauren joins us now from Eastbourne. Lauren, as we've just heard, yet more warnings and yet people still seem prepared to take the risk. Yes, this coastline draws in many people from across the southeast, but also from around the world to go for walks, have picnics and increasingly common take photos of themselves near the cliff edge. And as I could see myself from out on the boat looking up at the cliff face today, there are cracks all along it. But not only that, there are huge chunks and huge gaps further down where large chunks of chalk have simply just fallen away altogether, which is putting even more pressure on the top of the cliff face. Uh, the Coast Guard says when it comes to standing near the edge, there is simply no safe place to be. And they're also warning people to leave plenty of uh, room when standing at the bottom too. Lauren, thank you very much. It's exactly a quarter to seven. This is our top story tonight. Nearly half the MPs who responded to a BBC South East Today questionnaire say they've received death threats. The scale and scope of the abuse has left some of them considering giving up their political careers. Also in tonight's programme, let your fingers do the walking online. How the last physical copies of the yellow pages are going to be distributed in Brighton. And after another grey, cloudy day, finally some sunshine in the forecast tomorrow. I've got all the details coming up. Now, the all but forgotten story of how thousands of Chinese people travelled to Europe to help the Allies during the First World War has been uncovered by a Kent man who found a treasure trove of old photographs taken by his grandfather more than a century ago. It's estimated as many as 95,000 Chinese volunteered to come and work in Britain. Arriving from 1916 onwards, they were expected to work 10-hour days, seven days a week. Officially, 2,000 are buried in Commonwealth war graves, but it's thought as many as 20,000 may have lost their lives. Robin Gibson's been to meet John De Lucy from Tunbridge Wells for tonight's special report. <laughs> Faces of World War I, rarely seen or spoken of, brought to life by an all but forgotten collection of photographic plates dating back a century. He was fluent in Mandarin, so that was what they were really after, I think. The pictures were taken by this man, Lieutenant William Hawkins, previously an English colonial businessman who'd recruited and led the Chinese workers. His collection was left untouched in a sideboard passed down through his family. I was aware we had lots of family photographs of China, but I had no idea that the glass slides contained such important photographs of the First World War. The role of Chinese workers in World War I is relatively unknown. They were recruited from 1916 onwards to fill jobs done by men, now called up to replace the huge number of casualties. They worked long hours for small allowances. Thousands died, mostly through illness like the great flu epidemic of 1918. Their contribution was vital. They did everything from building the railways, loading ships, unloading ships, um, doing the laundry, um, loading the arms, and then um, they also worked in the in control of catering as well. They were very good at that. The uncovering of such rare photographs has been welcomed by those campaigning for greater recognition of the Chinese war effort. Certainly the hope is that we can um, build the recognition of their role in the First World War and put a monument up in London in due course. The pictures have now been published in a book and there are plans for an exhibition in China next year. Robin Gibson, BBC South East Today, Tunbridge Wells. Now it's 20 years since Dame Judi Dench first played Queen Victoria in the film Mrs Brown, the role which took her from the small screen and stage to a hugely successful film career. Well now, Dame Judi, who of course lives on the Surrey-Sussex border, is back playing the Queen in Victoria and Abdul, which tells the extraordinary true tale of the monarch's close friendship with an Indian servant. And playing her unhappy son, Prince Albert, is Bex Hill's Eddie Izzard. The premiere of the film is tonight in Leicester Square and just before we cross there to our our reporter, here's a taster of the film. You will present the Queen with a ceremonial coin. Whatever you do, you must not look at Her Majesty. 
She has requested Mr. Kareem be her personal footman. What can they be talking about? What is a mango? The queen of fruit. I would like a mango. They only grow in India. Well, I'm empress of India, so I have one cent. Mm. What is it? A mango, your majesty. It's off. Sir Henry, this mango is off. The man's a complete fraud. And here he is overlooking the boxes. I'm afraid it's true, Your Majesty. Abdul and his father are completely common. Oh, well, Sarah Smith is at uh, the premiere in Leicester Square for us now. Sarah, is, it's rather extraordinary, and it's a, a quite unknown part of Queen Victoria's life. Yes, this relationship with a clerk sent over from India just to present her with a, a commemorative coin during her jubilee year. But he catches the Queen's eye and he rises up through the ranks from a servant to a confidant, even teaching her to read and write Urdu. But all to the huge displeasure of the Queen's household, um, the Prime Minister and her son, the King-in-waiting, played by Eddie Izzard. So I spoke to Eddie Izzard and Dame Judi Tench here on the red carpet and asked them about that very difficult on relationship. It's also the story of a very unhappy relationship with her son. Yes, and a terrible, terrible tragedy, that. that, that I mean, I don't think poor Bertie, I don't think they, they had not, they hadn't, she hadn't got a good relationship really with any of her children. And not a comfortable relationship that she could, you know, my daughter, you know, I... I just comes round, we have a huge laugh together and it's glorious. I'm not sure that happened too much. But there was this, uh, as you say, an uncomfortable relationship on screen, a very different on set. With Bertie, not on set. On screen, not on set. Because I dote on him. It's good fun to work with on oh, set. Oh, Well, also, we've seen every show he's ever done. He's a genius. And it shows that very unhappy relationship between him and his mother. They did not get on. They, they were at loggerheads. They, uh, sh Victoria blamed Bertie for the death of his father, her, her husband, uh, um, um, Albert. Uh, because uh, Albert had read in the right act after he'd behaved very badly when he was about 24 hours in an autumn blustery day. He got uh, pneumonia, I think it was pneumonia, died two weeks later. So she blamed him for his death. And their relationship never recovered? No, it was, it was dark all the way through and, and really only on the deathbed was there a moment of linkage. She called for Bertie and he was there at the end and felt something, but you know, as uh, you know, an hour's connection over a lifetime is not great. So, you, as you heard, a very difficult relationship on screen, very different on set. They clearly had a whale of a time. The premiere is here tonight, and the film opens in two miles across the southeast on the 15th of September. Sarah, looks excellent. Thank you. Now, for decades, it was the only way to get hold of an emergency French polisher, or indeed to track down a book on fly fishing by J.R. Hartley. But from now on, you'll have to go online to do it. You will, because the Yellow Pages has slimmed down in recent years. Now it's giving in to the digital age. The last deliveries of the famously weighty tome will take place in two years' time. Now, the first version of the business directory was actually published in Brighton in 1966. Ten years later, was rolled out across the country. In its heyday, 30 million copies were being printed every year. But the last deliveries will be in Brighton, where it all started 50 years ago. Charlie Rose reports. No luck, Dad. Never mind. There's still a few more to try. The unmistakable yellow directory with an unforgettable advertising campaign. You do? Oh, that's wonderful. Can you keep it for me? My name, oh yes, it's J.R. Hartley. But things are changing. Soon anyone wishing to use the yellow pages to find that special book on fly fishing, or anything else for that matter, will only be able to do so online, bringing to an end 50 years of circulation. The usage of the book is in decline and we've decided that uh, it's time to announce the end of yellow pages. But when I say the end, we're delivering the last books in 2019 and they'll stay in people's homes for many years yet. Since the first Yellow Pages directory was launched in Brighton in 1966, up to a billion copies have been printed. That's roughly the length of more than a million Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers. 
And all those directories contain a total of up to a trillion pages laid end to end. That's enough to reach to Mars and back almost three times. Pretty much every household had one. They were almost a part of the furniture. But when was the last time anyone used the yellow pages? Oh, that would have been years ago, yeah. Yeah, probably early 90s. A couple of years ago, maybe, to be quite honest, maybe a year. Probably to look at a locksmith or something. 20 years ago, perhaps. <laughs> the yellow pages represents a, a moment of history when print was important, when distribution was cheap. It was the time of newspapers, morning and evening newspapers. Um, now we're in an electronic age of information. It's different. So it's a kiss goodbye to the paper pages and hello to the online directory. Finding that French polisher will never be the same again. Charlie Rose, BBC South East Today. I'm on my way. Oh, excellent. A little trip down memory lane there. <laughs> oh, we enjoyed that. Now, let's see what the weather's got in store for us. It's gone very autumnal, Nina. It has. It's going to stay autumnal, but perhaps picking up a little bit tomorrow. So, today, cloudy skies, but I have to say, I did find a bit of sunshine for you. Gravesend, we're used to that being our hot spot. Some breaks in that cloud today, but for most of us, it was pretty grey. We had some outbreaks of rain on and off throughout the day, and it's still raining in some places at the moment. We'll continue with that this evening and overnight tonight clearing through so by tomorrow we're going to look at some dry weather with some sunshine the rain on and off through the night tonight not particularly heavy and as we head into the early hours that's when it starts to clear away the cloud breaks up temperatures will drop to around 11 or 12 degrees so it is cooler than it was last night so some sunshine from the word go there'll be a little bit of patchy cloud developing throughout the afternoon the westerly breeze coming in just pegging down those temperatures so despite the sunshine it is is going to feel cooler we're looking at highs of around 17 to 18 degrees we might just get a 19 in one or two places now on Thursday again we're looking like we're going to stay mostly dry there will be a little bit more cloud I think as we go through the day and that might just trigger off one or two light and well scattered showers we're keeping that breezy feel to the day with temperatures again reaching highs quite widely of 17 to 18 degrees but in any brighter spots we might just get around 19 but it's all changed by Friday. Low pressure swings in along with some weather fronts, bring some rain which could be quite heavy. They clear away for the weekend, but with that low pressure staying close by, it looks like we'll see some further showers through Friday and Saturday into Sunday, staying quite cool at around 16 degrees. But at least the next couple of days looking mostly dry and bright. That's well, well, not a lot of comfort, Nina, but no, thank well, you very much. Thanks for time. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'll be back at 8 o'clock and at 10.25, so I'll see you a little later on. And that's it for me for tonight. I'll be back later in the week. See you then. Bye-bye.